call the meeting to order. So the first thing we do is consider our agenda. Okay. And actually, the first thing on the agenda we've already done, which is for me to call the meeting to order. Okay. The second thing is a, an approval of the agenda. Okay. So I ask, does anyone have any changes they'd like to make to the agenda tonight? Um, hearing none, we'll deem it approved by consensus. So the third item on the agenda is for comments from the chair. Um, and there's a subpar to introduce Emery Richardson. So welcome, Emery. Hi. Am I pronouncing it right? Yeah. OK, phonetic. Um, well, I'm excited that you've joined us. Do you know how long you'll be just for the year, or? Uh, I'm not really sure how it works, but um, okay. like as long as my schedule permits. Great, great. I, looked, I tried to look at the council minutes to see what sort of term they appointed you for, and I couldn't find any evidence of it. So <laughs> yeah. I we'll just go on a, as you can make it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how the terms work. So, okay. um, And we'll introduce ourselves briefly now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious, after we introduce ourselves, if you can tell us why you were interested in coming. And it's not meant to be a quiz. It's just meant to. <laughs> Kind of like what caught your eye. So we'll, we'll introduce ourselves first so you don't have to be the first one to talk. So, okay. Mike, why don't you? I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city. And Mike is um, on he's, staff. he's on staff with the city and he does, he supports us um, in a lot of ways. So, but he, he helps us a lot with coordinating with the city council and um, just advising us about how the work that we do is actually playing out and whether it's working, whether we need to make tweaks. So um, okay. that's really critical. And then he has the uh, planning expertise that not all of us have. Um, so mm -hmm. that's really critical, too. And I'm Leslie Welts. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair of the commission. Um, I've been part of the commission since the late 2014, August 2014. So I've been serving for a little while now. And I, I am an environmental attorney by day, which is how I mm -hmm. knew your father. And I really like being able to contribute to our city. Yeah. I, I've adopted as my home. You didn't really have a choice, but I adopted it as my home. And so I've been excited to be able to give it back, and this is the way I've been doing it. Uh, I'm John Adams. I joined the planning commission at the same time that Leslie did, and my background is in urban planning and in mapping. So John's the other member that has expertise, so Ariane does too. I like that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Kirby Keaton. Um, I've been around for two or three years now. It actually goes a lot quicker than you'd expect. Um, and I'm a tax attorney by day, uh, so really exciting stuff in other words. Hi, I'm Aaron Kosicki. Um, I've been here a few months. Uh, shockingly, I'm also a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. The only three in town. Really. Yeah. <laughs> well, four. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what, what kind of law would you say you practice now? Uh, regulatory. I'm just kidding. Administrative law. No, I, I, um, I regulate professions now. So. <laughs> I'm Ariane Kassam, and I work at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, so I work on reviewing affordable housing projects for funding. Cool. So. Uh, I'm Emery Richardson. Uh, I'm in seventh grade at Main Street Middle School. And uh, what interested me about this board commission uh, thing was just like, uh, like knowing where Montpelier is going in the future and kind of like having a say in it but like I don't really have I don't I don't really know how it works but like like knowing what's going to happen and like possibly having a say in it and like uh just helping the community and giving back so well yeah. that's great because you may not have noticed but we don't have any other seventh graders on the commission <laughs> <laughs> as much as we like to think that we're young we're not really that young anymore so. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You're the oldest one here. You're talking about maturity. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So it's it's really, I mean, don't be shy about offering your opinion and your thoughts because we don't have that perspective. I mean, the, the children that we have are much younger too. So, yeah. Great. Okay, so other comments from the chair. Um, next meeting, we're going to have to vote on our leadership. We have to do it every January, every year, January every year. So Kirby and I have discussed it, and we're both happy to continue on serving as chair and vice chair, but I wanted to flag it, and uh, if, if anyone else is interested in taking on a leadership role, you know, let's talk about it. Someone, nobody's clamoring. Thank no, you for voting. Nobody's, nobody's even making eye contact. That's <laughs> how so bad it is. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll vote on it on the next meeting. And, uh, but I just wanted to mention it in advance, so I didn't just blindside. Maybe you. I'm going to do a surprise, like, I think I'm going to do a coup. You don't know. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm going to nominate Emery. Well, we'll, we'll she, get to see. Tune in next week. She's open in the turn. Yeah, yeah. Really take yeah, I know. That's a pretty yeah. good position. Um, the other comments are that um, I still need to have lunch with Eric Gilbertson to hear how they're doing the the Historic Pre Preservation Commission and the Design Review Committee um, are moving forward with some recommendations on their their rules. Their, their rules, it's not really their rules, the, the parts of the zoning that would affect them. Um, so he has reached out to me to have lunch and I need to get back to him. So I just wanted to give you that update. And I think that's it as far as comments from the chair. I don't have anything else, but Ariane. I'd just be interested to hear if you guys went to the, um, the thing on the parking garage last week, if you have any, I don't know, updates or info from that. Oh, yes, um, I, I did attend. It was the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission's Project Review Committee's meeting. And they had the architect from the city's architect presenting the parking garage and hotel proposal. Um, we also had the Capitol Plaza owner present as well as a, the city manager. And they, they sort of walked through the proposal and explained some of the finer points, and all of the materials are available on okay. the city's website. It's, but it was just nice for me to have someone in the flesh explaining it all, because it's just easier for me to digest information. I, the review committee that was hosting doesn't actually participate in a formal sense. So it was really just as a sort of more like a courtesy yeah. uh, for them. That's my understanding of it. You you were around when it was announced, I think. Yeah, that's kind of how these like, subcommittees that we help on commission work. Is sometimes there's a basically presenters come in. And it's a it's a presentation more than any other kind of yeah. or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was Curious interesting, that. and some of the big takeaways <laughs> that I got, and probably everyone already knew all of these, but sorry. Because there's going to be an increase in parking, which is the main interest that I understand the city for having, uh, in addition to hopefully economic sort of injection by having people come and stay in Montpelier. And the biggest concerns that have been raised associated with this would be um, flooding, whether it's going to A, B, subject to flooding that would be would it negatively impact that infrastructure that we're planning to put there uh, and be whether it would increase flooding to other infrastructure nearby because when you put fill in you <laughs> you're raising it and you move that that water's got to go somewhere so those are some of the things that were being discussed um, my understanding is that the project is set for hearing before the act 250 district commission and that's happening tomorrow, I think? Yeah, I was going to say, it's this week, I thought. I think, yeah, it's happening very soon. And because it's in a designated downtown, some of the criteria criteria are waived. Mm. It's on this sort of fast track. And one would be compliance with the town plan. So and correct me if I've got any of this incorrect. <laughs> but that's my understanding of it. There's an increase in parking. Um, the rivers 
program at A and R had some concerns about whether the the first level of the hotel was high enough, whether it was, um, and the engine the architect was saying, well, we'd have to redo all of the plans and it would be very costly. So they're just sort of going to go forward with that proposal to the district commission and see how the district commission responds to that um, evidence. I don't know what so, the evidence is on either side. I'm just listing the concerns and arguments that I've heard. Do you know what it is, Mike? No. The floor elevation of the hotel. Um, is it lower than two feet plus the floodplain? It is, yes, but not by a lot, I think. It's like 1.7 or something. Ah, okay. All right. So welcome back. We Sorry. introduced Emery. Hi. And everybody went around and said their names when they joined and what their daytime Work Life is. is. <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry I'm late. I had a last minute uh, car problem, so I had to walk. So <laughs> it was a little bit longer oh, to get gosh. here. Um, yeah, I'm Barbara Connery. i am uh, been on the Planning Commission not as long as those two, but uh, and I'm a licensed architect and taught at Vermont Technical College in the Sustainable Design Program for 20 years. So um, now I just serve on a lot of boards. <laughs> <laughs> including one that's looking at the parking garage. <laughs> and Barbara has two grown-up children who went through the Montpelier school system. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, okay. Any other yeah, questions? No, I, thank you for the update. I was yeah. just, I was sorry to miss it, and so I was curious about the meeting. The big takeaway is it's going before the district commission this week, and yeah. we'll see what happens yeah. there. Was part of that also triggered by the flood issues? Is that what you had said before, Mike? Or were there additional flood issues triggered by the Act 250? Yeah, that it, once once the project got put into Act 250, then they had to meet the state rules instead of the local rules. And so I guess initially they didn't think they were going to have to go through Act 250, so they didn't design to Act 250 standards. And then afterwards, when they got put into Act 250, then they had to kind of go through and make some tweaks. So that's why they depressed we more the area. One foot. Yeah, we required one foot under the old zoning, and the hotel was approved last year. Oh. I was going to say, because I think our new river rules require The new river rules do require two feet, but the hotel had already been approved under the old ah, rules. That was when uh, we amended, we subdivided off. The parking garage became its own project and got redesigned, but the hotel remained the same. Then Act 250 came in and grabbed both pieces, and then both pieces got combined into a single project, even though they're two separate projects. One of which was already approved. One of which was already approved. Yeah, I and see. And so it ended up being a little bit more complicated. Um, Apparently the jurisdictional trigger was dwelling units. Number of dwelling units. Because it's been apparently it's been, been interpreted that a hotel room constitutes a dwelling unit. Oh, and if you have over a certain number of dwelling units, then it triggers Act 250 jurisdiction. For just that parcel, or did that encompass all of the parcels around it as no, well? No, just that just that parcel, but. There were two still, projects on the parcel. Yeah. Two projects on the parcel, mm -hmm. and they're subdividing the one piece so they kept them all as. And two different zoning um, ordinances. And two different zoning ordinances, mm -hmm. one, under yeah. one, one okay. under the other. So, is yeah. it well, number of dwelling units thing? Yeah. I, that's um, my understanding. That's what was presented. I haven't looked into any of the details. Yeah, I hadn't mm -hmm. ever understood that, but apparently it's been the case for a couple of years now that hotels are considered dwelling units under and each room would be a each room is considered mm -hmm. a dwelling unit and therefore an 80 room hotel is going to be treated like an 80 mm -hmm. wow. unit mm -hmm. apartment building and therefore it put it to Act 50. And some of the noteworthy details about the parking, how the parking will work, is the hotel pays for a certain number of parking spaces all the time, I think it's 200 spots, something like that. and. But when they're not being used, they can be double booked, so to speak. So you can come in and use them, you know, during the day when they're not in use already. By but the guests would have their automatic 
parking spot because the hotel's paid for it. And then I think some of the other uh, businesses around there might also pay for parking spaces. So, But it's utilizing the concept of shared parking that we had put into the zoning uh, yeah. ordinance. Yeah. There's too. no assigned parking. There's only, you can get parking passes and you get leases to parking, but it's not assigned. And that the consistent purchasing of parking spaces is going to enable the city to pay off on the investment faster than it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, yes. There were some concerns from the committee about, someone was asking about adequate parking and, and Bill kind of, Bill Frazier kind of laughed and said, we would not be doing this if it wasn't increasing parking. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's clear that that's the intent. And, and part of their intent too was to be in accordance with their current zoning so that they pulled the building back to a 20 foot setback from the top of bank. Okay. And they also reconfigured the original proposal for the exterior facade to give it a little bit more articulation so it's not just a slab yeah. of, it looks a little less like a parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Has yes. green walls. But the bike path will be right past it. Right so past it. Yeah. Enjoy the view. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the new parking, the new park for the confluence was presented the other night as well. That is Oh yeah, basically, do you want to give us a quick clip right, note? Yes. The, um well I I have the sketches that they presented, but they presented three different schemes for the the property that is at the end of the uh, transit center and basically right across the railroad tracks from the, the uh, parking garage. And um, Is it the same consulting group just came up with three options for consideration? Yeah, it's the three options, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. And um, they did a really nice job and there are lots of really interesting proposals. And then they are also, working with uh, the proposal, the potential proposal for developing the east side of the confluence as well, so that there would be matching, sort of matching parks. Because currently the city and the transit center development purchased the Moat property. Can you tell me where that, can you direct me on my Okay, so. Eminent beverage. Eminent okay. beverage. You're Thank standing, you're That's looking at needed. Shaw's. <laughs> it's where all the big equipment is right now, right, digging. Yeah. And they tore down Eminent beverage and they eliminated that parking lot mm -hmm. adjacent to the drawing board. Right, right. Okay. So it's that kind of wedge shaped piece of property oh, okay. there. Mm -hmm. And what the city had originally proposed for that was a development of a building and a parking lot. And what has to happen is that the the train has to be retained through there and the uh, bike path. The reason they purchased that land was to bring the bike path through it. Right, right. Okay. So, but there's a proposal for a more park. For a park there. rather than parking. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Lots of things happening. Yeah. And oh, I hate to ask this because it's going to keep us out of their agenda, but. How does that jive with the bridges proposal for sustainable? Anymore? It actually, the the Confluence Park is proposed is very close to what, what the I bridges uh, proposed, um, and so it's just a question of can they can the logistics be worked out to allow for the the park on the east side as well to match it? But some kind of a park needs to happen on the west side. Well, thanks. Any other general questions? We move on. All right, let's move on to item four. So this is where I invite uh, members from the public to comment on anything that's not on the agenda. I'm assuming we have no comments. <laughs> so we'll we'll move on to item five, which is to continue work on the full punch list of zoning fixes. Um, Mike, before you kick us off, back off into this, can you just give us a quick recap of what is actually before council right now and what we're continuing on? All right, we were supposed to go, I was supposed to go in front of council on the 9th, and I didn't end up making it into Montpelier that night, so I will be on the agenda next week on Thursday. They're having a Thursday meeting, so. The 24th. The 24th, and on the 24th I'll, do the general presentation on 
the slopes and the landscaping. So just those two, not the buildable area, but the slopes and the, the landscaping pieces. Kind of give an uh, overview presentation to council and see how much they want to get into the weeds on it um, and see if and when they might be ready for a discussion on or have a hearing on the interim adoption of those two pieces. Kirby, since you drafted this memo addressing both mm -hmm. steep slopes and buildable areas, mm -hmm. yeah. what are your thoughts about chopping it into two and sending the one on steep slopes to council now since we actually have a little time before the meeting where they're going to consider in, in some ways it would be easier because it coincides with, with what Mike's saying. Yeah. In other ways, the two are related. So in some ways it is helpful to have them in the same document. I mean, I don't, I don't think either, uh, there's not a big difference between doing it either way. But yeah, like I said, one advantage of them together is that some of the issues pointed out in the billable area um, section, I have it here, uh, relies on the steep slopes, like so they work together. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you can start building on them and then allowing more units on the built on the buildable or allowing more units on you know the parcels that have steep slopes means you can then build on those steep slopes mm -hmm. put the, the two together so that that aspect of it they kind of work together but I don't think it matters so much. Do commissioners feel like we should submit the memo to council now with a clarification about what is actually on their agenda and what will be coming later? And we can go back and look at the memo. I just kind right. of I think it'd be a lot cleaner to just let Mike go forward with the proposal uh, that uh, we have sort of unanimity on, um, including the allowance of building on a 30% slope okay. with DRB and engineered plans. Okay. So separate those two because the issues that are raised are different. And. Kirby, you said that the buildable areas relies a little bit on the slope. Would you say the reverse? I'm gonna. I would. I would need to do, change a little of the phrasing because it. The sections refer to one another a little bit, so mm -hmm. I would need to like not obviously like change the phrasing so that it doesn't do that. But that's really the only practical. Concern. I mean, there's only one part, one area where you actually refer back to the previous section. So. There's at least one. I was mm -hmm. thinking there might be another one. But All right, well, we let's that. table that and come back to it when we get to that part of our agenda. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to raise it now um, because it's part of our update <laughs> where we are. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, we'll come back to that when we get to item six. So for now, let's continue on our, our list of zoning fixes. So, Emery, we have um, these matrix matrix that Mike put together and the way that it's laid out. Well, Mike, why don't you describe it since you've worn it put it together? Yeah, so we're most of the way through it. Um, so we'll be starting on number 55. But so let me walk us what through you, what the columns are. Yeah, what you have for the three columns. The first column is the comment that was received. Many of these came from the zoning administrator because we're kind of doing a zoning the zoning rules were adopted last January. Um, so, I'm trying to see how they work. As soon practice. as we got them in, we started using them and realizing there were a couple of things that either we didn't have enough information on, it wasn't clear, or it was a typo or just needed to be fixed. So, there was a comment that said, You need to fix this. Um, there's a staff recommendation, which is my comments, which kind of go through and say, Yeah, I agree that this is a problem and this is how I might fix it. And then the right-hand column is what was decided by the Planning Commission. Sometimes they agreed with the staff, sometimes they didn't agree and they came up with a different decision. The yellow ones are just ones that need some additional work on my end. So I need to go through and put something together, make a map of the channelized stream banks, um, <laughs> those types of things. Um, so we've been working our way through and we're, as I said, we're up to number 54, so we've actually kind of gotten through a big chunk of them. What's left 
from 55 on, there are two sets of colors on the left-hand side. The yellow ones are ones that I think we need to talk about, and the green ones are ones I don't think we need to talk about. And so we can talk about whatever ones anyone have questions on, but some of them just seem to make, you know, there seems to be a logical answer to the question, so. We're trying to get through these relatively quickly so we can get on to the more important things of doing the city plan. Okay. So, this is important. This is important, mm -hmm. but Just we've all been exciting. waiting to get yes. to the city plan. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying. So, well, why don't you kick us off? Because it looks like the first one is to discuss. The first one is to discuss. So, um, 3204 is we are in the site plan section. And what we are talking about in 3204 is lighting, outdoor lighting. And so the comment was that for the most part, outdoor lighting has worked well. Two issues are with number three and number four. Um, number three talks about the uniformity requirement, which staff does not have any idea how to administer and enforce. I think the requirement is just that lighting shall be uniform. And we have projects like Timber Homes, which is a nine acre parcel. So what do you mean by having light uniform? Do we have to uniformly light the entire nine acres? It doesn't seem to make any sense that that's what you mean, but the requirement is to uniformly light. We thought it doesn't seem to serve any purpose. It actually, we would see a lot of the opposite that you would probably light the doorways slightly more than you would light the parking lot or the white walkway. So actually we kind of thought it actually was something we thought we could remove. We could strike number three because we didn't think it was useful and we don't have any way to administer it effectively. Number four, the requirement is that um, you have to have Energy Star rating. And we've actually had a lot of problems, surprisingly, for applicants meeting that requirement. Um, almost all of them, including ones who worked with Efficiency Vermont, had problems getting us the actual certification for Energy Star. So our recommendation is to change number four to shall be any LED lamps or Energy Star certified. So what are the problems with getting the certification? Are they we just, and the cut sheets don't say Energy Star on them. There'll be an LED light and it doesn't have energy and Energy Star certification. And so we don't know if that's. I don't think they're not necessarily certifying lamps you know, light bulbs. Yeah, so and that's, that's been our, that's been problem, our issue. So. Is we just, we, we, we're supposed to require it, and we've had a tough time getting that. So we think if it's LED, it's really, that's kind of our intent was to have energy efficient lighting. Yeah. So what we want to see is LED lights. So if you do, if it's Energy Star, that's great. Um, we'll accept that, but our recommendation would be to go with LED lamps as well. With number three, the uniformity ratio, that's for areas regularly tra um, traveled by vehicles or pedestrians. So if you have a nine acre parcel, you're not. Oh, it so where was that? Yeah, I was trying to, to trying to get back to it so I could. Yeah, for a nine know. acre parcel. Um, for more efficient lights, lighting light produce ratios of three to one or less between, between the highest and the lowest levels. Because we had unlit areas, so even a ratio of three to one, when you're trying to do a ratio from zero, you end up with zero. So, well, if but, it's an area regularly traveled by pedestrians and vehicles, we probably don't want a one that's it probably has more than zero foot candles there. And two, don't we want lighting where people are walking? Just for security and safety. It's yeah. I mean, sidewalks and things like that. It's also worded in a way that I think allows for it, for common sense. A 10 to 1 rate, it's just this ratio is in excess of 10 to 1 or strongly discouraged. Oh, yeah. It is, it is limited, Mike. It does say, outdoor lining shall be designed to provide a uniform distribution of light in areas regularly traversed by vehicles or pedestrians. Lower light levels. Uniform distribution of light. My okay. point. Like I said, I was following up on those comments. Mm -hmm. When they give you a lighting plan uh, for a parking lot, 
do they typically give you enough information on the light fixtures so that you know what the recommended spacing distance is between the fixtures? We have the information to be able to calculate the output pretty pretty well. So the, the, the lumens per acre. The lumen output. The lumen output. We usually have had a pretty easy time being able to follow up on that. Because then the photometrics should be able to show you the distribution of each of the fixtures. Um, but if they're not providing that, then it's pretty hard for you to tell. So maybe it's just a matter yeah, of what information a, you're getting. Yeah, maybe it's may or maybe it's a matter of understanding how to read the lighting. Photometrics. Photometrics. So. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm willing to to look at that and just go and look at that as a as a retraining. Do you maybe there's Do you have any suggestions for simplifying this one or? I think it's fine as is, and we just need to see whether it's possible to implement. <coughs> By simplifying it, you add some rigidity to it. Uh, maybe one thing, if the feedback was coming from the DRB, and it was like, we don't, this is hard to administer, but yeah. if the concern was we don't want to measure this over nine acres, well, that's not what's being asked here. So, I don't know. It seems like most plans come with measures of foot candles over traveled areas. Or we could require that they give enough information so that the zoning administrator could tell. if they're not providing it now. Yeah, I was just trying to remember back to some of the applications, what were some of the issues that we had with that? So yeah, I mean, I can see we can leave that. I mean, it's, it's not going to be the end of the world. We can. It's. It is, as you said, it is probably flexible enough that we could continue to to work on that. And as I said, maybe we'll see about um, having somebody explain a more straightforward way of being able to to read those to determine. Because I do know that the you know we'll get the map, which will have the numbers, and it'll be you know a blanket of ones. And then you'll get some numbers if it is just a matter of going and saying, you know, if it's six directly under and then it goes to threes and then ones, you know, is that a problem? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what we look at being able right. to go and say, can I just look at this and know, yeah, it's going to meet that rules. It goes from a six to a one, that would be more than a three to one, but it's less than a ten to one. It's probably mm -hmm. a question of identifying where people, where, you're, where people are, where those regularly traveled areas are, right? Yeah, because, well, yeah, and we do have some, there's some requirements. Yeah, because we've, we've got a site plan, so we would know where the walkway is. <coughs> and they do give you a distribution plan with numerical equivalents on it. Yes, okay. for the most part, that's, we've gotten those. Good. So well, maybe we're just missing keep. detail that's an issue, but let us know if there is. About number four, do, do everyone okay with the addition of or LED lights? Or it, LED or energy LED star. Or LED or energy star. Because they might not all be. Right, right. And I'll okay. talk with so you got Meredith and one. see what she's got on that one. Keep four, not three. So are we going to go through all the green ones, or are we just going to skip to the next yellow one? Well, I think we didn't, we didn't give people advance notice that we were going to use the consent agenda to go through the green ones, so I think we should go through them. All right. And what we don't get to today, we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll use a consent 
agenda method for, and if anyone has an issue on a green one, we'll, uh, we can discuss it. Otherwise, it's deemed approved. The staff recommendation is deemed approved. But for now, let's go through them. Okay. So, do we, we want to go through the yellow and then come back to the green to make sure we get through the yellow? That's a good yeah, idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, 57, 57 figure 3 22. Um, appears to be mixed up or it's not clear so uh, on this it's a table showing the total outputs if you're a commercial and have only partially shielded light then you can have 5,000 lumens if you have a mixture of fully or partially shielded then you can have 50,000 lumens so a developer just needs to add one fully shielded light to allow 10 times more lumens which doesn't make any sense Another possibility is that the second row is a subset of the first row, so you can have 50,000 lumens, but only 5,000 of which can be partial shielded. It's not what it says, but maybe that's what they meant. So my suggestion was to consider the partially cutoff is, considering the partial sh cutoff is such a small percentage of the total, maybe it would be clearer to simply change the top line to be fully cut off fixtures and the second line to be partially cut off fixtures. Someone could theoretically get 55,000 per acre doing 550k of full and 5k of partial, but it would be clearer. Otherwise, re -word, rewording it to, to clarify the top is total of all fixtures and the bottom is where allowed. Can you re summarize yeah. this? I, I, I got so, lost in all the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, I mean, that was elegant. On the. <laughs> <laughs> So the okay. way this has worked in the table here is there's a commercial and there's a multifamily, um, but the first line says under commercial is all fixtures, all light fixtures fully plus partially in zone one it's 50,000, in zone two it's 100,000. But if you have partially shielded lighting fixtures only, you get 5,000 lumens per acre, so it just... It seems that we would want more fully shielded lighting. That, that's really what we want. So you'd kind of want to go and take up top, and if you're looking at the, the parenthetical where it says fully plus partially, if you just strike the partially, then if all lighting fixtures are fully cut off, you'd get 50,000 lumens per acre because we're encouraging you to do that. We want mm -hmm. you to, to, mm -hmm. to do that. If you're going to do only partially shielded, then we're only going to give you 5,000 lumens per acre. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just the way it's worded here, it's like, well, as long as I've got one fully shielded light, all of a sudden I get 10 times the amount of, and it didn't seem to make any. I, I, I couldn't rationalize in my head where, where this was trying to go. So one answer was to just go make this fully, make that partial, and in which case somebody could theoretically do 50 plus 5 to yeah. get 55,000. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm like sorry. I have no more than 5,000 and come from a partly. Yeah, and that would be the other option would be to go and say here's what you've got. And so you're just saying strike partially from the top line, the all light pictures? Yeah, that's one of the options. I said. Just right. take that partially out and it becomes That seems the simplest method to yeah. deal with this, right? Everyone go with that approach? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, 62. 62. This is uh, a, a, just a general question of whether you want me to develop something. It's come up on a couple of times whether we wanted to have a general PUD section without any density bonuses. Just somebody wanted to be able to cluster a development um, for some reason. Is there anything preventing them from doing so? Right now we don't have any rules to allow them to do it. So if you want to do a PUD, you have to do one of our set PUDs that we have. But you could do a cluster PUD and just not make use of the density bonus, right? Not if it's a not if it's, it, well, yes, but you'd still have to meet those other requirements that are within that. You'd still have to do either a new neighborhood, and if you're in a district that didn't allow it, 
didn't allow that particular PUD. Um, so it was really more of a question. It, the, the other side where I would probably think maybe we don't is that um, Isn't it a lot of this is supposed to be zoning fixes, and, and that's really not a zoning fix as much as the other ones. But we've, we've had people who wondered whether we could. That's what I was wondering. What's that? What? Um, just seems well. I struggle sometimes with the whole concept of a PD when they're all just subdivisions that have different, different rules around them, and this is too just too vague to have. This isn't really proposing anything. It's just saying like I would, I would have like to, you I would have to craft. I would have to craft a PUD, mm -hmm. a more generalized PUD set of rules that you guys would have to consider. That this wouldn't be approving it. It they would just be telling me to do it. I wouldn't put in the work if you guys weren't interested in having seems like we have quite a variety of PUDs now that in fact I thought people were generally feeling that we had too many PUDs yeah the, the issue just being that what we have are a lot of very specific PUDs and if somebody just went and said I've got land that's that's a little bit disconnected I'm gonna subdivide I would like to subdivide them in this way I'm allowed to have three lots I want to make three lots but Three lots without proposing but development. Without proposing on. specifically an infill PUD because or, I don't need the density bonuses, but I just want us. So but it's they more. Meet the regular subdivision. Yeah, if they were, uh, if they were in the rural district and they wanted to just make three half acre lots, I just you know I've got this land, I've got plenty of density, but I just want to make three half acre lots. But I don't really want to go through the whole conservation PUD because that's really for something much bigger than what I want to do. I just want to make a couple of small lots. So it's really more about making lots, divide, subdividing lots than it is about developing. PUDs, yeah. PUDs are really subdivisions. But these are those specialized ones that we established before were sort of to encourage people to do certain types. Yes. And, and what you're saying is you're looking for something simpler so somebody could just subdivide land and not necessarily propose a de development on it. But that's is that a right? subdivision. Yeah, so is that different than a subdivision? I you don't know. You have to meet all of the zoning rules if you're doing subdivision. PUD lets you kind of break some of the, the rules. So, so I guess which ones do, uh, are being proposed to be broken with this? Uh, <laughs> and it could be, usually it's lot sizes or frontages or those types of rules that kind of give you more so when you, you wrote here, the idea has been mentioned, especially for owners of sites with challenging conditions. What, what do you mean by challenging conditions? Somebody could have, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent slopes. You're allowed to build on those. You're not losing the density on those. But uh, if, if they could take the density and move it up, they could be able to use it, more, use their land more effectively. They have enough buildable land in a certain area. We've just got different dynamics for, for individual lots. And so we've had people who've wanted to go and look at some of these PUDs. But having to meet one of the required PUDs puts them into a different box. And so, Do you have any examples? I'm trying to think about, um, for ones that have been more specifically proposed, um, I haven't had any of them that any of them that have specifically come in, but we also haven't had any PUDs come in either. So, um, any of the other PUDs. So, as I said, this one was less. This was one that that came in early in the process that somebody had asked about whether they could do just a general one, and I said no, and they were like, well. Seems like we could just drop the minimum lot size and not change the density. It becomes an accounting headache. No different than it would for a PUD. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of if you if if we're going to allow the, the the rules. Yeah, if you if it's just lot size, but the question sometimes comes up if it's. 
Um, sometimes it's lot size plus the setbacks. So if you want to get a waiver on setbacks because you're going to propose zero lot setbacks, and so you're going to do kind of a townhouse duplex. You can own half. You own the land plus this half, and that person owns the land, and well, that means you got a zero lot line setback in between, and you're required to have five feet. The only way that happens is through a PUD. So you end up with different options that can come up if you've got the flexibility of being able to propose zero or low lot. So like even with an infill development, I mean, does, would that infill PUD not permit you to have a zero? Those kind, I mean, would it depends if it's in a district that's allowed to have zero lot line. Oh, I see. So if, this if, if the broadens infill is it only to allowed other, it broadens it to other then districts. You then other to things. you just can't get a density bonus because a general PUD wouldn't. But if it's too, as I say, if it's if it's too much, if there was a lot of support that people really kind of wanted it, I could pull together some proposals. But I wouldn't want to get lost for forty five minutes trying to to push. I think that's where we're headed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your concern there because I, I think this is sort of a broader policy question that um, maybe is best put on hold for the time being. Um, we don't really have a clear proposal to consider. We're not really sure exactly what is missing in the zoning as it is, so giving a little bit more time to see if there are other issues that we could address with an additional PUD, I think it makes sense. And okay. I'm not hearing an appetite from the other commissioners. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm, I'm kind of curious to understand it. Well, both my personal understand it more and hear more about a proposal, but I don't want to right. know, take up time. That yeah. Um, but I'm yeah. I'm just kind of curious if there's people who aren't building on. You know, lots that they might build. Well, they might not necessarily build on them. Now, yeah, the, but the, yeah, the classic what you have in some cases is you know and this this goes to the question of the buildable areas, which I don't want to get too much into. But some communities will simply go through and say that you can't build on the wetlands, but you can move that density somewhere else. But sometimes moving that density somewhere else means you know you've got ten acres, five acres is wetland two-acre zoning districts, well, we'll let you move that up and do five one-acre lots by doing a PUD. And, you know, it's just a matter of, you're not getting any density bonus, you're getting exactly the same amount that you would, and you're conserving that area that you can't build on. Um, but if it were 20% slope, you can move it up. But sometimes you also then need waivers for other requirements, and the PUDs kind of build for that. This seems like a good issue to revisit as part of our city plan assessment when we mm -hmm. assess how the zoning is working towards achieving the goals that we set. Um, and if there's a gap that we need to fill, this, but we'll just be aware there mm -hmm. might be a gap. To look mm -hmm. at. So yeah, and maybe you know if you could think about any particular situations or conditions where this would be beneficial as we go into the city plan. That would help. Yeah. All right. Next yellow, 87. All right, 87. Okay. Part five definitions. Um, so we had back in part one. Part one is you know kind of the introduction. And what we had was some of a discussion about um, the first yellow one here on number three. We had a recommendation to we define development in part five, and then we had this informational bullet up in part one, and they weren't written exactly the same. So we said we really shouldn't have it that way. We really should strike the informational bullet. Mm -hmm. And you guys agreed. So we struck the informational bullet. The question that was left unanswered is 
three and this one are tied together is whether we should be moving the definition of development and this also refers to subdivision and parcel as well whether all three of those should potentially be moved up front up front meaning to part, to one. part one now the reason for that I've done this on a lot of my regulations is when we're reviewing applications as they come in, one of the first things we try to do is we, we vis envision applications kind of like a, a thing of buckets. So there's things, you can't reach the bottom buckets until you fall into the top bucket. And the first bucket is um, development. So what needs a zoning permit is development. And development has a definition. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I'll put that right up front to go through, here's the definition of development. and here are the exceptions. So we put in a big umbrella to say, there are two ways of doing it. You can put in a big umbrella and catch everything and then give some exceptions, or you can be very narrow and go through and say, only these things need to get a permit. And what zoning usually does is this big, broad definition of development being construction, installation, demolishing, reconstructing, converting, structurally alterating, blah, 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 all the way through, and then we have a list of exceptions. What we have in our zoning is our definition of development is in the back, and all of our exceptions are in the front. And so what I usually do is to put them together, where I have one list of, this is what needs a permit, and here are your exemptions, and putting them together, so we can have that initial review right there. And so usually, you don't define it in the back, because you'll put it in front. Why is this yellow? Sense. Sounds it's a change. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sounds then like fine, then whatever makes it easier good. for you. I agree we should keep all the There are a couple of things that just change things clearer for applicants big. too. It, it's just sometimes I don't know. You never know which one's gonna say. Which one somebody is gonna go and uh -huh. say Absolutely not. Um well, John so Anderson isn't here anymore. He was really into the definition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you only have three attorneys to do with <laughs> yeah. this. Um so the late addition, so these are in less less order because um, what happened was I put this list together now in maybe September, August, September, and we started going through them and then these things kept getting chipping back in. Um, so the next one, 109, for section 3002.C, we needed to clarify if a two unit building can be subdivided as if it's a single family dwelling. So, what we said for, I'll set the stage. 3002, <coughs> we talk about the density, and what we had all agreed and put into the zoning was that if you have a single family home, you can have a duplex. Yeah. yeah. So now the question comes up, if somebody has a duplex and wants to subdivide, how much land do they need? Sounds like a riddle. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, we, this is an actual case that we've had, is somebody who, you know, let's say you're in the zoning district, um, residential 6,000, and you have 12,000 square feet. And you have issue, how do we want to treat? Yeah, and you have a duplex. That's fine. <coughs> we want to treat them as though they're a single family <coughs> home for purposes of subdividing further, or do we want to treat them as already having two units for purposes of subdividing further? That's what my understanding. Is yes, really I have another wrinkle to throw into that is that if the existing building is actually a single family plus an accessory dwelling, because the other unit is so small that it really qualifies as an accessory which is not another dwelling unit by our definition, then it is a single family. That Regardless sounds... of how it's per, you know, how it's listed in the grand list. So that, this has actually been a question for me too. Um, Seems fine if you can meet all the other requirements. Yeah. Okay. Go nuts. Yeah, because what we had was a, an actual case of a residential 3,000, you know, if they had a 7,000 square foot lot and they wanted to subdivide the question was, they have the duplex. The duplex would fit on the 3,000 square foot lot, which would be allowed if they had a single family home. They could have subdivided, make a single family home, and then convert it to a duplex. The question is, if it's already a duplex, can you subdivide it? 
Sure. And we kind of thought yes, but it wasn't yeah. clear, so we just wanted to mm. confirm if everybody's okay with that, we can tweak those. And basically, if it, if it was 3,000 square feet from the beginning, the duplex would be allowed. Yep. Because it was so a single family so home. Just because it's having a particular duplex. order, I, yeah. I don't think it should operate. Agreed. Yeah. 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 And so we actually have told them because of the way the rules were, we're like, well, you could. Does anyone Remove have the single family home, but concerns with that approach? I have to say I don't really understand well, it. Well yeah, we should so, make sure you, everyone understands. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, I I'm right. not sure what I'm So not. going the one direction, I'll I'll talk about the first direction. So the way the zoning was written, if you have if you're in residential three thousand, you need to have three thousand square feet per unit. Mm -hmm. You have a three thousand five hundred square foot lot. So you, you can have a single family home. And then what our rule said was anyone who has a single family home on a legal lot is allowed to have a duplex. And I won't get into all the reasons why, but there, there are reasons why because of accessory apartment rules, um, it just made sense easier to enforce. So you can have a duplex. What we started to do is have some people who came in the other way to go through and say, wait, I have a duplex that's shuffled all the way over onto this side of the lot. And I have a 7,000 square foot lot. Can I subdivide my duplex and put it on a 3,500 square foot lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a different question than I thought you were asking. No, that okay. was the, that's the actual mm -hmm. application we received. So, so they actually they want to a, subdivide their property. They now want to subdivide the property so they would have a second building lot. Ah. Because it's empty anyways. So they want to take the empty lot. Um, subdivide it and they would keep their duplex a duplex and have that other lot to develop separately and the question is well you'd be doubling the density but for us we're like well they we could convert that. come in get a change of use convert the duplex to a single family home subdivide and then put another permit mm -hmm. back in to go back from a single family home yeah. to a duplex mm -hmm. and then build on the other lot they can get there anyways the yeah. question is do we want to make them jump through that many do we hoops? want to make them jump through all those hoops to sure to yeah. do that or do we just simply go and recognize that if you can do it this direction, we're going to let you do it this direction? How can you because convert an existing duplex back to a single family? You take, take the, the tenant, you take the kitchen out. You take the dividing or door. Even up. if you have tenants in there, you people would do that, or well, I, or you could claim that it was in, a single in family and accessory. Yeah, yeah, you um, could, there are you a couple could of ways. It. But um, but the important thing to remember is that you know with a three thousand square foot lot in Res 3000 that a single family home could become a duplex even though they don't have 6,000 square feet of lot area because oh. we're allowing that oh, to okay. increase our density capability in existing buildings. But if you have a three unit building on a small lot and extra space you couldn't do oh, it. Oh geez. No then it gets no. more complicated. Nope you can't with a three unit mm -hmm. because you don't have that guaranteed. Right. It's, it's, only, it's only a case for duplexes. Single to duplex, kind of. Yeah. And the policy rationale for that was that you're not changing the character of the neighborhood by having a second family living in that same building. Oh, okay. Three. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know, it's like, three. this is kind of arbitrary, <laughs> so, but all right. So, Mike, can I ask... The, drug legs, I guess. Are, are we done with that one, or can I ask the qu a, a similar question of what if you have an existing home with an accessory dwelling in it? Then they should be able to duplex as well. Yes. Right. Yes. We usually actually encourage people to apply as a duplex just because there's less restrictions. They're apply. Less, I mean, unless they're trying to get in, they apply for their zoning application. Because usually they're permitted uses either way. And the accessory apartments have other rules under them. Yeah. So you're approaching so it as though the accessory isn't there and needs to be permitted? Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's a single family home with an accessory already, can the single family home still convert to a duplex? Yes. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, right. Well, you can't. Because we. No, the, well, the conversion, I was thinking the conversion is to a the accessory apartment rule only applies for parcels that have a single family dwelling so if you want to add another unit over the garage so if you already had a house with 
an accessory apartment inside, mm -hmm. and then you wanted to add another apartment in the garage, you'd go from a single family to a triplex. To, to a three duplex. Unit, to a three unit. But, but we, our, un, our rules say that an accessory unit is not considered a dwelling unit. So that means that a single family home with an accessory only, is a one it single only family is, home. But it's only allowed for properties that are single family dwellings. So as soon as you add a second unit, you're now a two unit, not a single family, so you can't have the accessory apartment. Hey, and the accessory okay. apartment automatically gets booted to a, a unit. Okay, what, what are we that. practically talking about right now? She's asking about a very narrow, specific case about if you had a, a single family, as opposed to saying you went single family to duplex, which we allow, if you had a single family plus apartment. Right. I, I understand what the question is. I'm asking what's the, what are we really talking about? I guess about? the question is, it speaks to the policy of like how, do, how many dwelling units do we want mm. to be able to... <coughs> And be and present and on us. Yeah, can you have the apartment also divided into two other units, have basically three units, but then call yourself single family? Like, but is it, that it's not, not. And what Mike's saying is no. It's no. not you three equal one. units, though. Right. An accessory right. apartment right. is a very. You're tiny. following all this. You're just asking why are we. I'm, where does this fall on this question? <laughs> okay. that, that question is not on this it's one. A, yeah, I thought it was part of this one because <laughs> it's uh, it's come up from questions from the public for me three different yeah, conditions. Yeah, and, and the answer is we count, in, a, in our definition section here, we count the, the amount of use by the parcel, not by the structure. So if you have, we're going to look at it as, as soon as you have two units, as soon as you say, well, this is a single family home with an apartment, and you're going to put another apartment in, that's it, considered three units. But what if you have a single family plus accessory? That's well, not that's, a single family plus apartment. I mean, I think, but anyway. Yeah, it, yes. it's a good but conversation. But you can only have the accessory apartment with a single family property. Seems like a good conversation to continue. I'll tell him to go back. After we get through our <laughs> list, after the yeah. meeting. I'm just trying to avoid the double, you know, going back and forth like you were trying to avoid with yeah. this. Yeah, and that wouldn't be possible. So, yeah. business, so. Um, do we have consensus on number 109? Mm -hmm. What was? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, should operate the same, agreed. no matter what order you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so some under one 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 some conflict exists between three five zero five, which is lot arrangement. So three five zero five, we are talking about subdivision standards, and three five zero five is design and configuration of parcel boundaries. So if you're doing a subdivision lot arrangement, and 3009 stormwater. The former requires positive drainage away from buildings and not to concentrate drainage onto adjacent lots, while the latter says storm drainage shall not negatively affect adjacent properties. What? Double negative. <laughs> shall not negatively affect. Yes. I'm not sure if that's actually what it says. I'd have to mm. look that one up. My thought is that the former requirement under lot arrangement can be struck the act not all of 3505 but just that requirement the actual subdivision of land does not create drainage patterns when new lots are subdivided when new lots are developed they will need to meet the latter rules a subdivision could be designed to provide a common land location for concentrated drainage and treatment and infiltration i would rather we leave the requirement with some amount of performance standard to be met what is preventing these from being read in harmony because just because you need to ensure that there's drainage from your building doesn't mean that it has to go onto your neighbor's property. There's a way to achieve both, both taking it away from draining it from yours and not negatively affecting. All right, so it's number seven. So not developing a property that just has a slope that drains towards your neighbor's property. You are having catchment, catchment bays and right, right. But you would have to modify your lot significantly in order to create that. And I don't see why you couldn't have both, uh, both of them working together, too. Yeah. So this one, what number seven says, which this didn't say the specific, but number seven says so that application, the applicant shall design the subdivision so that there shall be positive drainage away from building sites and a coordinated stormwater drainage pattern for the subdivision that does not concentrate stormwater drainage from each lot 
to adjacent lots. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what that means is, as this is written, is you cannot concentrate the drainage. Don't create a drainage swale that, so that drains onto an adjacent property. Drives into an adjacent property, but you're doing the subdivision. So you couldn't, under this rule, concentrate the, the drainage to a common land parcel. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. You, Adjacent you couldn't, you lots couldn't make in a the pond subdivision. on lot two and have everything drain and into some swales that would eventually end up in the pond or the detention because you can't concentrate the storm drainage. I get. Yeah, um, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't read it as adjacent lots in the subdivision. Right. Everyone's assuming it's like the neighbor. The but, neighbor. Yeah, of course right. You can't drain it to the neighbor. Yeah. But it's. So, so I think it, my thought was we don't need number seven here because when the lot is going to be developed, it's going to have to meet three zero zero nine, which is our stormwater regulations. Does three zero zero nine ensure that there's positive drainage? It just says placeholder. <laughs> Mm -mm. Oh, it oh, it does. Because oh. <laughs> we don't have, have it. Yeah. Tools, it. No. I think there's. I might be looking at an old copy. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe you've got. Types of drainage systems. But it doesn't. It's hard to navigate. Um, it doesn't talk specific. Okay. 3009. It, there, it is. There is still. You have an older version on yours, apparently. Okay. It says drainage. final draft. Favorite what thing day? from like planners and attorneys. It's on three dash nineteen. Final, final draft on it. <laughs> one three two thousand eight. Oh yeah, you have, you, have an, you have an old. Look at the date. Page three dash one nine. Oh, wait. Yep. Yes, three dash yeah. one nine. Yep. So it does talk about storm stormwater drainage shall not negatively affect adjacent properties. Yes. So that in this case they would be talking about neighbors of the subdivision. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what's the proposal, Mike? Can you say? Uh, well, again? just to take out number seven out of the lot arrangement rules, mm -hmm. because it's going to be covered under three zero zero nine. And the other issue that we've come up with is a lot of the subdivision rules. Subdivision is the subdivision of land. There is no the development of those lots happens as a separate process, and so really there are times where it's difficult to. We write a lot of recommendations in these that kind of go into, well, this doesn't really happen until it's developed at a later time because we get an application just to subdivide the land, not to develop it. So I would just yeah. take out number seven. Any concerns with that? Okay. Okay. So you're taking out? Just number seven. Number seven only. <coughs> Okay, fun one. 117. <laughs> this, this actually should be pretty easy. Why um, is there a question mark yeah. after 3005? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a mix. 3000, so 3005 is um, riparian buffers. So water setbacks apply to everything that we put on that map that we adopted. Oh, yeah. And what we have found now is water step back still apply to buried streams, um, but not the required buffer. And I think the way we did that was we tried to remove the stream that was buried from the map. Yeah, and we did but that we in one case, and we found it two more. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So the suggestion was made by DPW. Um, so we still need possibly use a different setback suggestion made by DPW that we use 10 foot from center line of culvert or the buffer requirement whichever is greater the state if the the state wants to reopen as many of these buried streams as possible so if we at least require the buffer distance generally 50 percent of the water setback then we can restore the buffer in the future if we do so I think we're just looking at setbacks from a buried stream what should that number be? Um, and 
the first answer is DPW wants at least 10 feet so they can get in there and work on it. Another question is if we are looking to the future and saying we may want to uncover this stream, should we make it as wide as the setback would be or the buffer would be, but we're not going to actually require that. How many of these do we have? Yeah, that's um, we have found four of them already. So um, the most recent one we found was uh, if you're on the Barry Montpelier Road on Route 302, Sanal Auto Parts, it's a buried stream. It goes right through their parking lot. And they came in to put a proposal in for their parking lot. And that was when we discovered that there's actually a buried stream through that. Um, uh, there's entire subdivisions up off Berlin Street. Um, <coughs> there's a stream that's coming up. It's one of the longer ones. I want to say it's Wheelock, but it's not. It's a wheel. Is there a one of the ones that starts right at the bottom, right on River Street, comes all the way up to Berlin Street? Wheelock. To yeah, Wheelock? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So there's actually a stream that's paralleling it for quite a ways, and then it stops and it gets buried. And then there are a number of subdivisions that are kind of going off to, mm. the, to the right. And the stream is actually buried right up through backyards, front yards, side yards. So as people come in to do any number of projects, then it goes under and it goes up to the other side of Berlin Street and it starts hooking up and gets behind all of those houses that are on Berlin Street as, it, as that stream continues to get buried up. And then there's a farm on the top where it read daylights again. Mm. So a lot of projects, whether it's people want to build garden sheds or people want to build, you know, whatever we've got. <coughs> you know, what do we allow? Do we treat these as streams or do we ignore them all together? We've got a number of things we could do. We could ignore them all together. We could treat them as streams, we could do as um, DPW suggests, which is to keep a 10 foot, you know, we, we have them mapped. We simply go through and say 10 feet from the center line of that, you can't put any new structures. Is there an easement now through In some cases, properties? yes, in some cases, no. So people might not know that they're there. I think there are quite a number of people who probably don't even know that. that they a, have one. There is one there. Yeah. And then for somebody to propose in the future, oh, we're going to open this up, and they don't even know it's there. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> it's a surprise. Yeah. I wonder, wonder what their, yeah. you know, like their mortgage I don't think that would did. happen to open, the, to open some of those back up, but I, we should at least recognize the fact that the city <coughs> may need to get in there at some point <coughs> to repair that culvert, that buried stream. And Probably a good we, idea not to have sheds on it then not to put the shows oh, yeah. and stuff and so the DPW suggestion was just to say we'll, we'll map these we'll put it as a separate marker on our natural resource inventory so you'll have streams and then you'll have buried streams that might be a dashed line and then in the rules we can just set a thing that says anything at the dashed line we'll have a 10 foot setback for any new structures well, plus we or minus. probably add that buried stream that we removed back on the map yeah, it actually is. Where on, it was, it yeah. actually is. That's that one is uh, Gallison Hill. Right. That was uh, a Malone property that had a buried stream. But um, Zach, who is the GIS specialist, seems to think he's got a good database that we might be able to pull some of that data out of to make a more accurate map for us. But even if it's not on the map, if we've got a rule that says buried streams are treated this way. Yeah, so how do we want to treat them? That's the next question. Yes. So I would suggest the, at least the plus or minus 10 feet. What would it be if they were if they were above ground? What would the setback be? It would depend on the district. It goes back to the district table in here. So if you were... For Eastern Gateway, we talked about Sanal Auto Parts having their thing. They had a 50-foot setback from water, so that would be plus or minus 50 feet. We thought that was probably a little much. If it's in someone's backyard, that would probably eliminate building potential. That would probably have a significant effect. So that was why I think there was the...
at least a plus or minus 10 feet. Who makes the decision about reopening? Oh, that would have to be something. I've just, when I've heard from some people, and I talk about the fact that we have buried streams, they're like, oh, we should, you know, we, we should work to get those unburied at some point. And just for aesthetic reasons or something else? Water quality, flood, some of these. But I think the reality is when you look at where a lot of these buried streams are, you know, running through people's backyards, running through people's front yards, up through roads, it kind of doesn't seem likely in a lot of cases that they'll ever be uncovered. But occasionally, there are ones that are in an area that might be, but. So, 10 feet from the center line of the culvert, which would yeah. be, would that be five on other side, or 20? 10, 10 feet from the center line. So yeah, 10, 20 feet. 10 feet on other one, so 20 yep. feet. Okay. All right, everyone. Go yeah, I don't know how yeah. big these culverts are, but I would DPW. They bury it. There's one in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> Dig down, you'll find yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I would assume 20 feet is enough. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that was what their suggestion is. I mean, nothing will be bigger than that. We're not Philadelphia. So. <laughs> yeah, we're usually carrying, you know, if it was a six foot pipe, that would be pretty big. All right, what's our next one? Uh, Let's continue this until 7, and then let's switch to talk about the memo. All right, so now we jump back to 2.10, to figure 210, which, so these are the zoning districts in part 2. So... Residential 6,000 zoning district is a relatively common district. It's found in a lot of places. And it's been, it's come up in three different cases now. Um, it's been noted that the setback is now 15 feet in mm -hmm. front. So the front setback is now 15 feet under the old zoning for the similar sized zoning district, we had different names, but MDR used to have 10 feet for the setback. So it makes a difference for some projects, um, but uh, let's see, but I typically found that their, the neighbor neighbor, setbacks. their neighbors were 15 feet. Mm -hmm. Example already exists for matching abutting property, so I would leave as is. So I think I made this yellow. My recommendation is not to change it, but it was an issue that had come through my office enough times that I thought I at least wanted to let mm -hmm. you guys know we'd gotten this comment for Gallison Hill, College Street, um, a couple of them that the front setbacks were 10 feet, we moved them to 15 feet, and... But then they would still be covered by the matching adjacent properties. Yes, if they have matching adjacent properties, they could match them. Yeah. And so so you that was that why I said yeah, they, they have an out to do it, but right. because I'd gotten enough comments on it. Um, and similarly on 211, the next one down... Well, wait, well, before we move on, mm -hmm. um, were the... What were their arguments in support of the smaller setback? Other than the fact that it used to be smaller. Uh, in, in some cases, you don't always end up getting your 15 feet. So I think in one case, they did not have 10 feet to the left and right but they had a subdivision which had identified a building footprint for where they were going to build the house, and they had subdivided under the old rules and were now ready to build under the new rules and now could not build because their building footprint isn't allowed. So they had to redesign their project and move back because they had subdivided under an assumption they could build a building where they now came. Well, that's not really a very compelling argument. It's unfortunate, why, though. Why were the setbacks increased? It, it wasn't 
for the most part, setbacks almost always got smaller or remained the same, and we just, uh, Brandy did most of the, the legwork on these to come up with these looking at Google Maps and these other things, and she found that most of them had 15-foot setbacks. And so even though, you know, I don't think she was specifically we looking at the old, the right, the yeah, yeah, we were trying to match what's oh. on the ground, so she was just looking what's on the ground and wasn't looking at the old zoning. I and think what also might have happened is that this neighborhood in particular lobbied pretty hard to get down zoned. Um, so those dimensional requirements were drawn from the post-war neighborhoods, whereas they are an older neighborhood that is actually of higher density, so that's why maybe mm. uh, those things don't match up. So they did have to redesign. They could not build on that building footprint Correct. that was identified. Correct. But it was still possible to build. Uh, they haven't gotten a permit yet. They're still working on it. Mm. So, but as I said, that was just one of them. I should leave it as it is. All right, that was my recommendation. I would leave this one as it is. Everyone comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the second one where we found there was a difference between the old zoning and the new zoning and how things got harder was in residential 9,000. Um, it's been noted the front setback changed from 10 feet to 20 feet, mm -hmm. and the side setback went from 10 feet to 15 feet. Um, so my comments on that was that the side setback looks like it could be moved to 10 feet, but there are waiver provisions that we have in the zoning now. Most of residential 9,000 areas met the 20-foot setback, but I could see 15 as there is no waiver for front setbacks or we could allow such waivers. So the waiver for matching adjacent properties is not part of res 9,000? I think the issue is 9,000 tends to have, things tend to be spread out a little bit more in the 9,000s. Yeah. But they would still potentially have adjacent neighbors. I think they, I think they would. So the front could could work that way. But that one had a much greater shift than the other one did. Mm -hmm. And actually, Gallison Hill was the Res Nine Thousand one. Mm -hmm. So was 6, this was also matched to what was on the ground, right? Yes. And you said there's a waiver? There are waiver provisions. I think, I mean, unless the matching side setbacks is only for certain zoning districts, I'm pretty sure it applies to any zoning district. Setback. I mean, it sort of makes sense that we're moving up. We went from a front setback of 15 feet in yeah. res 6 to 20 feet in res 9. Yeah, incremental. Mm -hmm. What's your recommendation? I think on this one, it's been a while since I wrote some of these, so i got to get my brain engaged in mm -hmm. where I was thinking. But I think in some of these, um, the side setback could be moved to 10 feet. But there are waiver provisions. So I don't know if there's necessarily anything that has to be done on this one. I mean, I certainly, usually if I had a specific recommendation, I would, I would usually be pretty clear. <coughs> but I think this was just these two together were really a matter of pointing out the fact that, for the most part, we made things a lot got smaller, setbacks got smaller to try to match what was on the ground. And in these two cases, we made things a little bit bigger. And a couple of people have pointed out that we've made those changes. But I don't think either one yeah. is the end of the world. They both. I think maybe maybe doing the suggestion on this one and allowing some more flexibility, maybe having things slightly closer together, because they're still still going to 
It's not going to look any more squished together than the Res 6000. Uh, worst case, so I don't see any problem with. So you're suggesting that we change the side, both both the front and the side? I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, what I'm understanding from Mike is that he's he seems to think the side of ten makes sense. Wow. So, um, I didn't get a strong sense of. Huh? No. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's some... You don't, have a, you don't have a strong recommendation, but do you have a recommendation? Do I have a recommendation? Um, We're going to come back to I'm just looking at the waiver really quick. Was, um, so the waiver is for side 10 feet less than the district standard, but not less than 5 feet. And... Yeah, so there's... There are waiver provisions in there to get back to. For front and side? For, as side, for side and rear. I'm just trying to find that front setback that has the, I know it's in here somewhere about matching. Yeah, I tried to find that one time too. talk about it above there is an exemption that already exists for matching abutting property so I would imagine that that would apply in this district as well so I don't think we have to change anything I guess would be my recommendation okay. Okay. Go with I think that? it's just important for everybody okay. to know that there were a couple of places we found where it got harder to develop like you said there's waivers right? there are waivers um, suggestion uh, and I actually I believe John made this suggestion to add three and four unit residential to the site plan exemption. And this goes back to scene number 42. The idea of exempting smaller residential projects from site plan makes sense, but as a policy decision, the board should review the site plan criteria to see if we would want to make sure they are reviewed. If not, they should be exempt. So I believe John's suggestion was under, under site plan, by statute, single and two-family structures are exempt from site plan. Which um, rule provision is site plan? 3201. 3 Some of the thinking behind this was you can get a mortgage for four unit the same way you would for a single family, and we have a lot of one to four unit buildings that are actually four units of multifamily. Five units multifamily. Uh, well, yeah, I guess not in accordance to the building code, though, right? Wouldn't Chris be considering four units? Yeah, I don't know how Under Chris. different criteria than one to three. I don't know. Maybe it does only split at five. I thought it split at five, but I'm not really clear in the building. So what site plan does look at though is bike and pedestrian, landscaping and screening, mm -hmm. uh, outdoor lighting, outdoor seating and display, which probably wouldn't apply anyways, solar access and shading, and design and compatibility. So if we exempted three and four units, those rules would no longer apply. <coughs> to a three and four unit building. And so currently the three and four units are considered major, they're going for major site plan approval? Or? Uh, it depends on the project. They okay. could be a major, they could be a minor. They could, but in any case, doing. they yeah. need to meet those requirements. Yeah, we would have to evaluate. I guess I'd rather keep them with some overview. Well, they have some. They yeah, but with, with these specific, um, areas that we asked for before. So what's the argument uh, for taking them out, three and four? Well, we're trying to encourage more housing units, more households coming to Montpelier, and it seems a little weird that 
someone who wanted to add a unit and create like a four unit building, an existing building, would then have to come up with a like plan, a pedestrian plan, and, and go through all of this review mm -hmm. for something that it seems like the standards are written for significant development. We've got a lot of stuff in, in place here. We have 170 pages of regulations that we still need to apply to this, and we have to go through design review. Um, I guess it's just raising that, raising that bar a little bit. I guess it'd be helpful if we could see an example as, as anybody tried to apply for three or four. I mean, they're still going to have to go through to get a building permit. Yeah, so and they'll still need a zoning permit. They just won't need to go through site plan. They'll um, need a zoning and a building, right? Yeah. And we've gone through the, the proposal we put together for the landscaping requirements, went through and more clearly defined what projects we're going to need it. So a, a renovation project is probably going to be less likely to trigger any of the or many of the landscaping requirements because you need to have a parking lot with 10 or more. If you don't, you don't need to meet the parking lot requirement. Um, you know, there are just certain certain triggers, and if you don't hit them, you're, you might not have to. So, so this now, three or four units may not need to click very many of these boxes. So even though there are seven requirements, bike and pedestrian may easily be able to be met, or it may be something that's met. We still have to get the in process. here, go by the neighbors, have public hearing. Yes. Well, it, yeah, that may be triggered in other areas too. You're still going to end up getting an engineer because you need sprinklers and a number of other building requirements oh, yes, that fall into place. play. For three and four, yeah. yeah. So, Mike, what's your recommendation? I mean, you wrote that it makes sense to you, but what, what does that mean? Uh, well, I was listening to, to John's description of his recommendation, and I thought, you know, it's a fairly straightforward process. How many projects would we deny for, you know, parking for, for bicycles and... I, I didn't think there were a lot of these as major significant projects. Um, I mean, one of the goals that we had in our putting forward our new zoning was efficiency and streamlining the process. I think we streamlined it. I think for most of the smaller ones, they're going to be minor site plans. They're going to be administrative. It's not going to be as big of a deal. Um, I, I think if, you, if your goal is to really make it, yeah. yeah, really streamline it, then it would make sense. That's why I kind of really fall back. It's, it's really a policy decision. From an administrative standpoint, I can do it either way. We aren't having a hard time approving these small projects right now. I think when we get to the city plan, we're going to talk about housing a lot, and we're going to talk about, as I plan to talk about, um, take, tearing down barriers to like getting more housing units in, and this would be the kind of thing we'll be searching for, so let's skip a bunch of time and go ahead and remove this requirement. Yeah. <laughs> Any concerns with that? I just, I guess I'd um, like to see a consideration more in terms of what would actually be triggered in site plan review. If, mm -hmm. if someone is going to suddenly discover that their neighbor on the, on the neighboring property are building a four unit building, then um, this gives them some assurance yeah, putting in screening or something. that they are putting well, in screening. Yeah, I mean, they're sort of just doing minimal. Why don't we come back to this at our next meeting then? Or we, we could a... wait until we do the city plan if, you know, if that's something that Kirby wants to bring up then. Well, here's what I'm thinking. We only have three more yellow, so I'd like to get through those. Um, and then at the next meeting, we'll have all of the green treated as a consent agenda, where that means that you're gonna, we're going to deem staff's recommendation approved unless somebody has a concern with one of these items. And so we can go back to this 
this yellow one um, at the next meeting. Okay. And if, if at that point we decide we want to wait for the city plan, we can, but at least we'll have a little bit more time to talk about it. So that was item 125. So let's no do decision. 126. So 126, I think it's yellow primarily because we had talked about not doing anything for this for signs at this point. Yes. And my recommendation for this one was the definition of signs. Any device, and it's a pretty long definition of used for visual communications intended to attract the attention of the public and visible from the public right away or other properties. And I think I just wanted to put in there commercial. I think we were just getting some other for commercial purposes after the words. Do you mind if I just look at yours quickly? It'll be easier to the phone. Oh, yes, yes. Used for visual communications for commercial purposes, intended to attract the attention. What would, what would the outcome be? It would be there would be less approval process for signs that weren't commercial. We're this, talking about this garage may go to the sale. Question is, well, it's there's non-commercial signs. Usually, there's an exemption. Usually, you tend to only regulate commercial signage, and our definitions of signs actually contains any any of those types of communications, even if they're commercial or non-commercial. I'm fine. So, so what would be a definition of a non-commercial? Would it be a Bernie sandwich Sanders board? Bernie Sanders sucks. <laughs> but That's we said, a but not commercial sign. But yeah. political signs but are. This, th but this doesn't say. This says any sign which is intended to attract the communications yeah. of people. I thought we separated sign. political signs. We do, but we define sign as including, as including everything that. that attracts attention. Mm -hmm. So this is saying that it has to be of the right size yes. and it has to be pretty. Right. I mean, well, your Bernie Sanders sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not regulating But what we're trying to do is to go and say we really are. Manner. Time time manner. Manner. Hmm. Yeah. Limiting to. Um, the, the idea was to get that, but I also know we had had a discussion that said we wanted to kind of table a lot of the sign stuff because we really wanted to pull pull signs out, maybe make a separate sign ordinance, and really um, kind of tackle that as its own thing. So I didn't. But this is a small change. This is a small change that people are willing to. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we should do that. Okay. I mean, we could always come back to signs. And Uh, so these last two kind of came up very recently. Um, one is uh, Chapter 470, which is enforcement, should be revised and organized more like Chapter 400 of the River Hazard Regulations. So our administrative officer found that the enforcement rules are too restrictive and not organized well in the zoning. So she reviewed the River Hazard rules which are following the same statute and found them to be much clearer and it would require a large strikeout. So before I do that, I wanted to go and get your blessings first. The primary issue she had, just by way of example, is um, somebody has an illegal sign that they put in the wrong place. And so they said they were going to put it on their site plan here and they put it five feet closer to the road, which we notice them with a notice of violation, and they have to fix it. But under the river hazard rules, we have a provision that gives the zoning administrator the ability to um, sign an agreement with a property owner where you cannot come into compliance. You know, if we said, hey, you're supposed to have screening there, and you don't have screening, and it's January, we can't expect you to go out and be planting arborvitaes or fences in January. So we would make a provision that says, you have to fix it, and you have to fix it by May 30th. In the same way, this person has to move a sign, and they can't move the sign in January. They've got to wait till the spring. But they don't, Meredith doesn't have the ability to simply oh. sign an agreement. And say you do it later. And say you, you have to do it, and okay. you're going to agree to do it, but here's your deadline. Um, and we just want to be a little bit more business friendly and be able to sign these types of agreements. And so that was her recommendation and kind of why. Go with the strikeout. 
Everyone good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you really want to see it, you can look at the river hazard rags. Oh, <laughs> They'll kind of look awful lot like that. Um, so 3007, the last yellow. What is 3007? <laughs> uh, steep slopes. H2 um, states that development cannot create slopes greater than 30%, but we have now proposed to relax those rules. We would recommend adding to the end of that statement with, with out an engineered plan, if you want positive with an engineered plan. Um, so what the design standard says is, to the maximum extent feasible, development on steep slopes shall be designed to not create slopes greater than 30%. They're steeper than 30%, and all I would say is not to create slopes steeper than 30% without an engineered plan. It's already allowing yeah. for them, right? Well, there. So this it just goes, says try <coughs> not to. Shall not create slopes. Well, yeah, this it doesn't goes to limit that maximum them. extent feasible, but yeah, that's not the easiest one to work with. So the, the same rule comes in again for the reason we proposed to remove the prohibition was because of things yep. like. Roadside lines. dishes, uh, roadside ditches, which have a three to one slope. So, as written right now, yep. if you want to create a roadside ditch, you can't. Yeah. Because you would create a 30% slope. And so, what the proposal was actually from an engineer was that why don't you just go and give us without an engineer plan? So, if you want to create some minor slopes that are 30%, not create we'll let slopes steeper than 30% without an engineer plan. But it's, <coughs> I'm not looking exactly how this is going to look, but you're telling us that it will still be a review process. It's not. Yes. It's not that the engineer plan is the only thing. Correct. Okay. It's gonna. Yeah. They're. They're. 12 provisions in that design requirement, but one of which says you cannot create uh, slopes steeper than 30 percent. To the maximum extent feasible. To the maximum extent feasible, but again. So now they could, they could still do it, but yeah. At least in some ways this is giving them a yeah. stronger requirement. Yeah. Every, time, every time we rewrite a section, when Meredith and I rewrite a section, there will not be a maximum extent feasible because it's <laughs> impossibly yep. right. Mm -hmm. Because you know the extent feasible when you're reviewing it, right? <laughs> or, well, to the maximum extent feasible means you can also never deny an application. Right, right. Yeah. Well, everyone go with staff so. recommendation on this last one. Okay. Yes. All right, so, whew, made it through the yellows. Yeah, so we'll come back to the greens at the next meeting, which will be January 28th, by the way. Um, Do we want to have a situation where it's Unless we bring it up, yes, we're good to go. Yes, yes. And there is gonna... one yellow we're going to revisit, which is 125, and everything and, else. And just... and number four. Oh, and number four. four. Technically number four. Oh. Which some of you were here for, some of you weren't. Which we will address that next time. Which the question was. We were back to the definition of development on that one. And the issue of that one, which we never made a decision on, was um, if you had an unpaved surface and you wanted to pave it, do you need to get a zoning permit for it? And we just needed, as administrators, an answer to the question because we actually had somebody who had a six-foot path and they wanted to take their six-foot gravel path and make it a six-foot paved path. And is that development? Does it need to get a permit? And we just need to have an answer to that question. And so that's what number four was. And we really never, we kind of went around and around for it was really 45 annoying. minutes. I don't want to think about it again. And it was, it was one of these ones I just needed an answer to. I it was a no answer wasn't an answer. We just needed to have some answer that would say we had to pick one. Either yes, it was going to need a permit, or no, it was not. I don't honestly care either way as long as I know what to tell somebody who comes in and asks. So we'll. Have a quick show of hands, and if we get four, okay. then we got one. <laughs> and then numbers 56 through 130, they're going to be deemed approved unless comments are raised at the next meeting. Concerns are raised. Okay. Okay. 
next item on the agenda, let's see, is to talk about the memo that Kirby wrote, which was, well, why don't you talk about the intent of the memo, since uh, you wrote it. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> as I recall, I was asked at the last meeting to kind of put down a, a the viewpoint of the entire group based on the votes <laughs> we've had on these two issues. One is, you know, the issue of whether construction on social 30% is ever allowed, and we've all agreed that with an engineer plan and DRB approval that it should be and that it's too rigid. So, that, so the first section of the memo just explains that, and we had a consensus vote on it. Um, I broke down the memo as, you know, I tried to keep this as brief as possible to try to, you know, be, be friendly and convenient for the city council most of all. Uh, so we just briefly put what the suggested change is, what our vote was, the background that I thought was most relevant, and then just to help them make decisions with sort of some bullet points put the advantages and the disadvantages of each. I tried to make clear at the top that, you know, since we clear, you know, in a situation where we voted to approve something, we thought the advantages out the disadvantages, just didn't want them to be confused by us approving something and then pointing out the disadvantages. We're just trying to be transparent. The second issue, of course, the second <coughs> major section of the memo is whether the, um, is about building the area, or whether we should use that. When no, no, I didn't. I didn't use the word "buildable area" when I stated mm -hmm. the issue the first time. But that's what it's about. Uh, and now I need to tell you guys that you know we've discussed this quite a bit, and the last vote uh, was five to one. One factual clarification I need right now is for the September 10 vote. What exactly was the word with that vote? It I think was, I think I've changed it was the four portal. One. It was a I portal think because was four Kim was not here. Kim was not here. Right. I think it was four to one. And and five to one was after Kim was gone. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Well, that's my most recent version has that, so I'll keep that. Um, I've incorporated in this version in front of us. This is version two because I had one draft where I had Barb look at it because she had a lot of input into this issue, and Mike, and. Um, I don't think the versions in front of you probably reflect Mike. Mike had one they changed change, one word, yeah. uh, which I've done that in, the, in my most up-to-date copy. I've added some changes based on Barb's suggestions, but then Barb had some other larger suggestions to make to that to that second section. At which point I could. Did you make changes after I sent you the email? I made changes after you sent the email. Because you said I thought you said that. You did, weren't going to have time to make those changes. I did. I did say that originally, but then I had the thing open and I had your thoughts in my brain. So I said, you know what? I'm going to add in the things that are. Okay. There was an email that said update. Update. Uh, like 20 minutes later. Um, yeah, I can try to run through what I've changed already based on. Well, okay. I because I ended up making from. changes. You know, I, I edited it myself because I thought that you weren't going to have time. Okay. Well, then, I mean, you can go ahead and go through those, and if they've, some of them may have already But it may changed. make substantive changes that you may not agree with. But um, unfortunately, my printer does not print red. So these are, well, do you want to do it this way? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine well, with you walking Let's through first there. decide the scope of this memo yep. before we go through all the edits, because I think that's something in flux right now based on... Mm -hmm. The fact that council already has the steep slope proposal in front of them, mm -hmm. and that alone is not particularly controversial. It's more the buildable areas piece. So, do we want to reframe the memo to just be addressing buildable areas, and then submit that with this packet of proposed changes together? Does that mm -hmm. sound reasonable to everybody? Okay. Sure, but why do we need to have a memo about the non-controversial, the slopes of 30%? I guess I thought Kirby was writing the memo to reflect the sort of dissension. Yeah, the disagreement. Everyone likes a good memo. 
Well, okay. I, I mean, mean, I'm just I curious. I just got out of control. So <laughs> I, some result, no, it, that was the charge, was to do both of those issues, because they were kind of related. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I mean, I'm fine. What I, I just, yeah. I wasn't sure that we needed it. But we but. can drop it, is exactly what I'm proposing right now, and what you're suggesting oh, okay. we do. Let's drop the steep slopes from this memo. And we can refer to that the building on steep till, slopes. Yeah. Building on steep building slopes. Building on steep slopes, and then we would hold this memo until. The yeah. Well, I guess my question was, does Kirby need to write about anything that we bring to the council? I thought he was just writing this because about the second issue. Yeah, I th that's what we are deciding right now. Makes oh, okay. Sense. Mm -hmm. so, so you were already there, apparently. Oh. Yeah. But yeah. They're interrelated. And, and uh, I'm, he I'm hearing this. There's maybe even a question about the first part of this: whether we send a memo at all. Yeah, that was my it, question. It, I mean, I guess. It, I think I don't think we should. I think we should just cut that right, out. Right. Is there any? Yeah. Is there any reason to think that? Because I worked Council hard, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. You put your hands. <laughs> you know, I, I don't doubt that. I'm just kidding. Um, just New Year's I'm not. Year. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding, Kirby. I know you worked hard. Um, but I mean, do you think there's going to be more value to the council? I, mean, I don't. I, I don't. It doesn't sound like it's controversial. It's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I had just blended them in my mind, and and steep slope, slopes do need to be part of the discussion of the biblical areas memo. But that doesn't mean that the the vote about building mm -hmm. on steep slopes needs to be. There's no harm in sending this. As a separate memo, you think? <laughs> there is if we send it now, because I'll probably spend two hours at the next council meeting talking about buildable areas that is not actually on their agenda because we sent them a memo to talk about it. He just he no, no, the no. first part. Oh, yeah. No, no, just separating them. Oh, yeah. Separate. There, there's a few options here. Okay, um, so there's the option of not sending the memo at all. I'll just put that out there. I don't think we want to do that. Um, there's the option of sending the memo as written which it doesn't sound like that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it'll spend a lot of time for Mike spinning wheels over something that's not on the agenda. It's not our time. <laughs> <laughs> the third option is that we break these into two separate memos and send one now for the item that is on their agenda and hold the one that isn't until it is on their agenda. Another option is to just completely delete the section that talks about the first part of the memo that is with the steep slopes, and then revise the second part of the memo, make that the only memo regarding buildable area. Those are our four options. Those are our four <laughs> options that I see them. And you have to pick from one of the four, yeah. John. You can't make another one up. I mean, because there are, is anyone writing about the land? Are you going to write something about the landscaping then? It just, to me, it looks odd if Kirby's writing about Well, the reason thing. why we decided that we should do that is because we weren't all on the same page when it came to build, build our area. I mean, we had a vote. We, we right. re-voted, but Barb had some serious concerns, and we all agreed that it made sense to advise the council of the drawbacks of going forward with this as a way to show, you know, we have a united front, you know, we have... We did vote on this, we did discuss this, but some counselors, some commissioners, you know, had some concerns. So this is a way to, to submit a, a memo to the council advising them that we acknowledge there are con some concerns. The fifth that option is that Mike just has this in his back pocket. <laughs> They're like, wouldn't it be nice to have a memo on it? <laughs> <laughs> as a, a separate memo or as a combined memo? As a separate memo. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah. the benefit of having the separate memo is that, that you may get comments from the public about this because I've already heard comments from the public, but, you know, about specifically the building on 30% slopes. So it might be helpful to have the position of the commission to present to the council. So we're not going to we're not going to do no memo. That option's gone. That's what I'm hearing. Um, we aren't going to submit the memo as is, right? Oh, John's the only one who seems to want. No, I'm not. Well, not. Um, so then the question is: Do we want to break it into two memos, or do we want to drop? I mean, either we're breaking it into two, or we're dropping part. But, but there's a sub part there where we could officially send it to council as a separate memo or we could just what, provide it to Mike so that he can have as a document that it's a resource to, if in case it comes that's up. That's true, yeah. What's it? 
the first part of the memo that yeah. Kirby wrote. Okay, so, the sh so in the short term, the next meeting, they're going to take up the 30% slope to greater construction. And, and landscaping. And yep. landscaping. Yep. Mm -hmm. But landscaping has been pretty non-controversial. Okay. I haven't had any public comment. So my question to you, it. Mike, is knowing what you know when you deal with the council, does the first part of this memo provide any insight that, the, that you think that the council will probably value when you make your presentation on the issue at the next meeting? They probably could get some value out of that in that they would be able to understand the unanimous support of the Planning Commission, why you made the decision that you did, and Kirby's put in the time to organize it. I think it could be pretty easily. I moved to split this into two <laughs> and then seven. <laughs> Got a motion on the floor. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Um, any discussion? Do we want to? My only request in is that what on that issue of construction on slopes of 30% or greater, that we actually cite the section of the zoning ordinance that is section 3007, steep slopes and 3008 erosion control, so that when the council gets it, they can open their zoning document and look right at it. Okay. I know what said, said amendment from Commissioner Conroy. <laughs> Very formal. Done. Thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining. And just to be clear, th this vote we are not sending the latter part of the memo. Correct. Correct. All right. At That's this why I want to make that clear. Yeah, it wasn't record. clear in them. Okay. And so yeah. I'll, I'll modify it and, and give it to Get it over to me and get it to council. Okay, okay so the motion carries. Um, and by, by said memo, I meant you record it on Snapchat and then send it to the council. <laughs> 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 getting punchy. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so minutes. Let's look at the minutes. Yeah. So are we not going to we're not going to discuss the other portion <laughs> of the memo tonight? Then. No, let's hold off on that. Why don't you get your comments to Kirby or um, or, or review what Kirby? Yeah, well, I think at this point, since I've done this, I'd rather distribute it here because I can't. We can't discuss it outside of this room. Right. So I would rather distribute it here, and then people can. Okay. Why don't yeah. you distribute okay, it? Okay. So it's and only going to be. We'll look at the revised. Right. So it's not going to be the front page because that was the piece that we just said would be, and everything that looks really light is was uh, added, added verbiage. Okay. So, and I have six copies. Can you just pass the back? Actually, I'll give you one too. Yeah. I, I, do, uh, I can take it that way. Huh? I can take it by email if you don't. Yeah, want I just want to make sure that. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I will send it by email as well if okay. you would prefer that. Do you want that? No, this is fine. Okay. This I mean, procedurally, fine. should I send it by email so that it becomes part of our record? Uh, you probably should at least send it to me. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. Before John leaves, do we have a... Let's turn to the minutes from December 10th. Do we have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. By John. Any discussion? Can I just get a clarification on the last section of that where it says remove re review memos from Barb and Mike and finalize slopes changes consider a motion to forward draft to council for consideration as an interim amendment um, again we seem to be mixing the two I don't know maybe maybe it's clear enough um, but now we are now we're talking about two memos where, 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 you, where, where you at the bottom? To... Are you're looking at December 10, right? Yeah. Yeah, at the bottom it says review memos from Barb and Mike and finalize slopes changes. Oh, from the bottom of the first page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think that was the title of the agenda item. Okay. Oh, and then the bold is what was you written. you and I could each written memo. So. Is the bold okay. what was also written on the agenda? Consider motion to forward the draft? Yes. That was on the agenda. Okay. Okay. Um, so in the back, then the discussion was... Um, Again, mix is the two. Uh, I think it's technically correct. Okay. All right. The proposal was to have Kirby. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. All right. The buildable area will be sec submitted later. Yeah, buildable okay. area is section 3002. So the motion that section 3007, the steep slopes with the landscaping package, be forwarded to council. So where's the 5-1 vote that's referenced in the memo in the in the minutes? Did we take them? No, it's not it's not this time. It was a while a while back. Oh okay. Well then the yes. memo says December 10th. There was a vote on December 10th. Yeah, there was. This is the I, the I think that the, I think there was the a motion passed on a 5 0 vote. It's the last line. That's what's recorded in the memo. So oh, there, I'm sorry, the 4-1. Right. I'm sorry, you're talking about the 4-1 vote in the memo. That's that's well, brackets of 4 No. Oh. Well, it, five it says 5-1, and I, I guess I thought... Yeah, there. I, I think there was a motion. I don't think it ended up here because it ended up being withdrawn because what we ended up with was a kind of chasing ourselves around. <laughs> and we ended up with a 5-1 five, uh, five vote. It says 5-0 here, though. Yeah. But so we had we a 5-1 sure. vote, and then... We had to try to figure out how we were going to send a memo forward, and then after the 5 1 vote, I made a recommendation that said rather than waiting until, because then, then the discussion was maybe we'll meet to talk about the memo. And I said at this meeting or the next meeting, I was like, why don't oh, we so just this move is about forward? The landscaping. The, yeah, why don't we yeah. just move forward with what we all agree on? And then we decided to amend it to only extend the steep slopes and landscaping because we all agree on steep slopes, we all agree on landscaping, we'll leave buildable area for later, and we passed a new motion at five to nothing. So that was the motion was to, to move forward with the building on sleep, steep slopes. Yes. Yeah, I thought so too. I knew we but separated them, but I thought we, we voted on buildable area. I think there was a vote. Yes. Yeah, but that wasn't in de on that on December 10th. That was previously. It was at both times. No, it was December 10th. So I think it's So there were two motions. <laughs> <laughs> I think there where's was the, a motion. Where's the five ones? Like I them. might have to go and check. Do we want to just table these yep. until yep. the next meeting? Okay. I'll yes. table so. these and review the video. Because I think there was one motion that was in there that maybe. Five Okay. All right. Table and review. Okay. Thank you, Darren. John. Second. Thank you, John. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, this is a non debatable motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. And we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Next meeting is January 28th.